Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Crystal Weeby, who will be sitting in for Matt Watson today. Crystal, what's up? I'm here. It's a, what is it, a Tuesday? Yeah, yeah. who knows what day this will come out. But right. It could be a Tuesday, it could be a Wednesday, it could be really any day. And the thing that's important to remember is whatever day you're listening to this podcast on, that today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io. Good to get that out of the way. Now, got an interesting topic today. Crystal, you are the founder of Beer Paws, which can be found at www.beerpaws.com. Also true? That is true. Okay, so what exactly are Beer Paws? So Beer Paws actually started with a bottle opener for your dog's collar. Okay. Yeah, like around the time uh, Boulevard switched to a pry-off cap about seven-ish years ago, I was living in a Boulevard type of drinking household and suddenly it was a struggle to get into a beer. Everyone would be like, well, shoot, where is it? What drawer did it get put in? And I've always been kind of like a crazy, crazy about my dogs kind of girl. And it occurred to me, well, shoot, I should just put the bottle opener on the dog's collar at the Golden Retriever. You know, they're real good dogs and like Velcro dogs. So I never had to worry about finding the bottle opener again. I had a blog at the time and it had been kind of toying around with ways to monetize that. And so I started selling those bottle openers that was called it a beer paw. And people were like, well, that's cool. Dogs and drinking. What else can you do? Right. And I went down the rabbit hole. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the rabbit hole. Uh, for so many of us, it doesn't have a bottom. <laughs> right. Um, first off, a couple of things. I have never met a beer that I couldn't get into. <laughs> I, <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Like, I have used maybe anything, including magic powers like the force to open a beer so yeah i've uh, i've you know but i the struggle is real um i get that so now your business today is not centric around beer opening dog collars but instead you've taken a a different approach and i think our listeners are going to enjoy that so let's uh let's go ahead and uh get everyone update well first off once again, go to beerpaws.com, and while you're on the internet, go to at beerpaws on the gram. Heck yeah. You'll see some pictures of stuff. While you're there, you can check out the at Startup Hustle podcast and if, uh, IG page. And, you know, while you're there, go all in. Head over to YouTube and check out and like and subscribe to the Startup Hustle YouTube channel. So, yeah. Do all those Enough things. Enough of that. Let's talk about <laughs> what Beer Paws does now. Ready, set, go. Go. So, yeah, I fell down that rabbit hole and was like, dogs drinking, okay. And I was working in the promotional products field at that time, running social media for a division of Staples. So I was already just, like, fascinated by really, like, promotional products and all the opportunities there. And as I was in this, like, dogs and drinking rabbit hole, I realized that one of the things that I could do is work with breweries to use their spent grains, which is virtually the only waste product, byproduct of the beer industry, and take some of those and turn them into a healthy dog treat. So home brewers were doing it. I first started working with home brewers, and they kind of led me to small breweries and on and on. And so in the past six years, we have I've partnered with over 80 different craft breweries to do uh, co-branded dog treats for them. Sometimes that was like a one-off, and sometimes they carry them. Inevitably, Kansas City Beer Company works with us a lot. I have a bunch of breweries that we work with in Nebraska and a handful in Oklahoma and Arkansas and then kind of scattered throughout. Um, And then you can't have a company called Beer Paws without a beer. So... (laughs) Now, <laughs> and, and just to clarify, this isn't about dogs drinking beer. It is the product, like you mentioned, repurposing. I, I like any business that takes a waste product and makes something cool with it. Um, but, you know, so um, as I was g- getting really in-depth as into my research for today's episode, because, <laughs> you know, uh, for those of you listening, I spend most of my time doing that. But 
Actually, it's not true. So I went to beerpause.com last night because I was like, what the hell is this? But it looks like you really have, so you have a relationship with a lot of different brewers. I mean, there was like a ton of stuff on there. I was really kind of surprised. Um, how, do you know how many it is total right off hand? Or? Um, so it's, we've got, I think, featured on the website still something like 70 plus. Um, and we, you know, we get emails all the time from newer, a lot of newer startup breweries that are looking for innovative or fun ways to promote themselves and fun products to carry. Of course, this is always a real busy time of year. People have gifts in mind. Um, but yeah, we essentially can just take a little bit of their spent grains and mix that up into our master batch and provide these co-branded products. Um, so yeah, tons of breweries. And like I said, some of them we work really closely with um, and others it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll collaborate for an event here or there. And I've gotten in touch with a lot of the breweries. Our initial contact was at beer festivals. I've gone out to Great American Beer Festival the past four years, and that's a big, huge, crazy setup that's really expensive but really fun. And all my entire uh, demographic is there, craft beer people who love their dogs. So it's a great so, place so to meet our end user. These breweries with their spent grains, is that something that they just give you? Or, I mean, do you have to buy them? Or is it different? Or, I mean, is mm -hmm. it like, are they like, yeah, I mean, whatever, we're going to throw them away anyway? Or? Yeah, it kind of depends on the brewery. But um, we, to, to date, I haven't had to purchase any, any spent grains. And we also, unless we're using it as our base, like, you know, for example, we work in the, the headquarters until just recently it was across the street from Kansas City Beer Co., um, so I can use, I use a lot of their spent grains, for example, as, as a base, but if it's a brewery that we're working with further away or something else, you know, we'll just, we'll kind of mix them into the batch. So I don't necessarily need enough for it to be worth it for anyone to get into a, we're selling these spent grains. And then other breweries, uh, like Fringe Beer Works, for example, in Lee Summit, they're a smaller brewery. They're happy for us to take as much as we can. I see. So, so do these, do, now do the breweries then turn around and also act as a sales channel in some regards? Like, because yeah. I, I mean, I think that that would, I mean, is that a major source of, of sales for you after? Yeah. The wholesale, the wholesale uh, revenue has always been a big, a big part of my model. And for the longest time, it's starting to kind of even out now, but for the longest time, the breweries were a bigger element of my wholesale uh, side of my business compared to the like dog bakeries and things like that. So I really, in the beginning when I started this, there was people uh, couldn't quite get their head around the concept of, oh, you're making a beer for my dog and you're giving them a biscuit kind of made with beer. Like it was a challenge for them. But now there's just kind of a lot of things going on culturally. Well, there's technically not any beer that the dog gets. Right. It's grain. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I do make a beer. We have a liquid treat for the dog as well, but there's no alcohol in that. So. Right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, like, when you first started doing this, this dates all the way back to 2013. Mm -hmm. So of all people I know, you are definitely the foremost expert at dog <laughs> biscuit creation <laughs> with six years under your belt. I've known some people that have made some different dog-related products, but, yeah. that's yeah. So now... Where do you make this stuff? So, um, as of just a couple of months ago, um, it's being made at a little uh, little spot in Peculiar, Missouri. Okay. Is and that where you're from as well? Or it's like not. I'm, I'm a Nebraska girl, but been in KC for about 15 years. Um, and so, I, I had been making, I moved all of the like, total, like, bootstrapping, startup style. I started the business in my house in Waldo and moved in as it progressed, just more and more like commercial equipment, big, huge ovens until it completely took over my home and just kept hustling, kept my head down, baking my dog treats. And so just recently, um, I finally was able to get my house back, which has been exciting because I teamed up. It's like it's <laughs> always like a milestone moment was, for entrepreneurs yeah. in many ways. No, I get yeah. it. Like it, I kind of I kind of laughed out loud there because right. yeah, it is. You're yeah. like, wow, I got my house back. Now but what do I do with it? Then I immediately didn't have it back though because I was like, well, maybe I should turn it into an Airbnb. Um, but I digress. So just a few months ago, I started working closely with Barkville Bakery, which is another local dog treat company, and she needed equipment and kind of wanted to get stuff out of her house. I, I want to back up for yeah, a second. So sure. back to the origin story here. 
at some point you're like, you know what? I could make a beer biscuit for a dog. Like, is that really how that happened? Were you just messing around? I was. Well, it was trying to make something for your dog, or like. I was. I was trying to figure out what else I could do uh, as well as those bottle openers because people were legit like, oh. So you were searching for something, mm-hmm. a product right. or whatever. You yeah. were looking for a hustle. Yep. I had okay. I had my brand. I had kind of a vision in the back of my head of not working in corporate forever. So so with the back to the callers, I mean, was that something? That, I mean, did you generate reasonable amounts of revenue with those or was that just kind of like? Sell just, a few here, sell a few there. Yeah, just it was just a little bit. Like that was so early. Like I went to uh, a Cinco de Mayo event with a mm-hmm. hundred bottle openers and and sold a few, and then would sell them through. I had a blog where I talked about reviewed other people's pet products and whatnot. Um, so it was really like a passion project. And then I I got involved with uh, Beta Blocks, yeah. startup accelerator, and they kind of confirmed as well the thoughts I already had and that I was hearing is that, yeah, you have a full-fledged brand. You should do something else. And it made sense to keep following this consumable. I'd already started experimenting with the spent grain dog treats at that time. And then I just went head down and hit that pretty hard. But the bottle openers I think the thing that's cool with the treats, though, is like anytime you can mitigate or like remove cost of goods. I mean, obviously, you've got a time and effort of going and picking it up. But um, I don't know how expensive grain is. I don't think it's the world's most expensive substance, but I mean, no cost of goods is usually better than cost yeah. of goods if you can avoid it. And then if you can turn that the the participant or the contributor into sure. a sales channel, okay. Yeah. And I think that's pretty clever and pretty smart. Yeah. So so as you as you made some of these and you you're working with the callers. Now the problem is when you're a sing, a single product company. I mean, you're going to sell it or you're not. It's exactly. not like you have a, a, quote, product line. You have mm-hmm. a product. And like you mentioned, you might go to some events and maybe you sell 100 dog collars. Maybe you sell two. You never know until you go do it. Right. Um, so having a little bit of different stuff to offer, especially mm-hmm. like this is such a niche thing. Like, I mean, let's be realistic. Like if you just want to give your dog a biscuit, you might not give them a beer biscuit. Right. But, you know, people love, I mean, I don't know. I get it. I've had dogs before, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, and, and people spoil the dogs. So, um, so at what point did you really realize you were onto something with the biscuits and you're like, you know what, now that's the primary product, right? Yep. The biscuits and then the, the dog beer. Okay. Yeah. So those are the, those are the core products. I mean, I just kind of had my, I had my head down and I started soliciting wholesale opportunities, trying to get into stores. You know, I've been kind of, you know, in and out of like the high V's over the past few years, but at the time. And, f- and for those of you listening, high V's is just a uh, grocery chain that's here in Kansas City. They're all around. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, I forget. I, I know. I, we have <laughs> listeners all over. I try to clarify some of that. So, getting distribution, what were some of your challenges that came with that? Um, getting people to take you seriously and figuring out like who do we even talk to, things like that. Um, I remember getting. Uh, Boulevard, when Boulevard became an account, it was kind of a big deal. I tried to knock on that door a few times, and we were already working with uh, uh, probably a dozen breweries at that point. But I started doing the the One Million Cups circuits, yep. which I don't know if everyone listening knows what that is. Yeah, we've talked about it before. Okay. So it's, it's, it's pitch practice and also, I mean, good exposure. Sure. Yeah. Did, did that help? It did. It really helped um, with exposure. It was re- was my main goal in doing that, and I did the a big circuit on that and like for a couple of years I was all over but I remember being at the when Kansas you say you did the circuit like you just you intentionally went to one one million cups is, fr- is from them. Kansas City but you can only be on it once yeah yeah I got I've been, invited I've been back a, a I haven't times. done it as a presenter but I've been a, a panelist um which was fun and interesting. I wish it wasn't so early in the morning. <laughs> yeah. um, but so you literally went and did it in a bunch of different places. I did. Huh. So when I started the company, I don't think I've heard anybody say they've done that. Really? So, yeah. Not not that they like intentionally like traveled right. and toured. Yeah, I ran across a few when I was I mean, doing that. A few s- other some people who go did on that. on the t- on tour with like Fish or Humphreys McGee or like the Grateful <laughs> Dead. You just went on the One Million Cups tour. I did. So, yeah. I just started applying to city after city, but. Um, from the beginning, I knew that I didn't want it to be Beer Pulse to be just a Kansas City company. I, I had my vision, my grandiose vision of it being, you know, a big, a big national pet treat, dog treat brand. 
And so the easiest way for me to make it not just a Kansas City brand was to go home to Nebraska and start knocking on doors up there. All 12 of them? All 12 of them, yeah. No, and no, I'm just joking. I mean, Nebraska actually, Omaha has a has a really robust startup scene. It's yeah. kind of the northern point of what many will call the uh, Silicon Prairie. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, Omaha has more millionaires per capita than any other city. And one really big one. Well, yeah, they're, <laughs> I think they're kind of revolving around the Berkshire Hathaway <laughs> stuff. But, yeah, and that's, uh, but, yeah, there's some stuff going on there. Um, so, okay, so obviously Link, is Lincoln the other town in Nebraska? <laughs> other than when the football stadium's full there, and then that's actually, like, the second biggest population in the state, I think. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. massive. Yeah. yeah, so so I've spent a lot of time in uh, in Lincoln and Omaha for beer paws over the past few years. Where else did you take it? Um, so Arkansas, okay, and Oklahoma, and then head out to Denver for the Great American Beer Festival every year, and continue just to try to pick more things up. More recently, this is kind of a a tool that I I hope people will actually, if you have a product that you would like to get more uh, buyers from, I was invited to be part of a this wholesale marketplace that's been really helpful for me in the past few months called FAIR, F-A-I-R-E. I have yeah. no, no affiliation other than they, I'm, I'm on there. It. But it's been an incredible resource for me in getting more wholesale buyers and the types of stores and boutiques that I never even would have approached. Like there was a record store, bought my products from Michigan. I never even would have called them up to say, hey, do you think you might want to carry these right. cool dog treats? So that's been really great in the past few years. And I feel like I'm jumping around, but that's been so awesome and so helpful that I've been telling lots of other small manu manufacturers to check it out because it just it makes the selling part of it a little more passive. By the way, you're allowed to jump around. That's the conversational <laughs> nature of Startup Hustle. It's it clearly reflects my ADD on many days. But, <laughs> Amen, brother. But, that, you know, that's the way it goes. I mean, the, and that's the thing is there's, um, you know, getting to where you want to be is never a linear journey. Right. It bounces around. Mm -hmm. You know, you do some stuff. Something, you know, for me, I try a bunch of different stuff. I'm hoping that something works. Right. You just and, throw the spaghetti at the wall. Yeah, and, and literally. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the thing. And you got to figure out what works and, what, and what's good for you. Um, I like that you have explored a lot of different things. A fair, as you call it. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right. If you, now, you can, it, whether you have a product or even a software product or a lot of different things, you really should try to get yourself into places like that. Yep where you can, these are called sales channels, and sales channels can change your business. Oh and you gosh. never know, but if you're not in there, they're yeah. going to pick something else. Oh, yeah. They're going to do something else, and, you know, like, so that's it. But the thing is, is you only need to go, like, apply and deal with the hustle of getting in there, like, right. once or maybe oh my gosh. somewhat regularly. And I don't know how it is for, you know, for the software channels and whatnot, that, or that industry, but I'm getting approached by a whole bunch of, things like fair and yeah. wholesale marketplaces, I feel like that's really Well, you get into one right of them now. and now their competitors oh want gosh. you in there too. Yeah. And, you know, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. But, I mean, the kind of rule one of sales and marketing is like the more eyes that you can get your product in front of, the better yeah. off. Now, um, especially when you have something like, okay, dogs are not niche when it comes to people. Like every, like all mm -hmm. kinds of people have dogs. Right. Like there are things like, okay, you mentioned you're from Nebraska. I assume you're a corn Huskers fan. I'm actually not very sporty, but you know, I, I thought, it, I I thought it was required right. when you were from there, but, but it's like <laughs> something that like people are super passionate about there, yeah. but you don't get a huge level of adoption outside of that, exactly. that area. So like if you're trying to sell Nebraska corn Huskers gear in Connecticut, you're going to have a tough go. Yeah, real tough. Yeah. But you know, like, you know, so, but with dogs, like, I mean, people own dogs everywhere and people will spend more money on their dogs than they'll spend on themselves or their kids. So. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit here. So at, people likely get confused that you're like trying to serve beer to dogs. They do. <laughs> Have you had some people get shitty with you about that? Oh yeah. They get like real uncomfortable and why would I do that? A yeah. lot of times the people that have that response are they're I mean they're just not my target market at all right I don't know I'm, I'm trying to be nice about it but yeah they just they just kind of they don't they don't get it and that's okay I'm like hey this is what I'm doing if you're not cool with it that's fine 
Go can on. dogs even get drunk? Is that a thing? Oh, they can, actually. And that's the other thing I have to educate people on. Like hops um, and alcohol, of course, are toxic for dogs. So a lot of people, especially mm. at the beer festivals, oh, he he likes his Boulevard or he likes his Coors Light. Yeah, I just, don't, give I just, your, yeah. don't give your dog beer. Yeah. And, you know, I, I laugh a little bit. Oh, well, you I know, if they, t- if they lap up a little, it's no big lever. deal. Their liver. Yeah. Their liver has a tough time metabolizing. Totally. You know, I know that. And that's just from growing up around dumb asses that were, like, right. pouring a beer into their dog's bowl. And right. you're like, dude, you're killing your dog. Yeah, don't do it. Yeah. So we get, there's, have to have those educational moments. But like you were kind of getting at, I mean, if I'm in a live selling situation, just because I'm at a at a pet expo or something, every person that walks up to my table, maybe they have a dog, but they're not necessarily my customer. Yeah. So once again, go to beerpaws.com and you can go buy your dog some beer biscuits. You know what you can do right now that's kind of fun? Tell me. So uh, my my partner in the in the treat room, the little the retail shop that we're opening, she and I are uh, collaborated on a fun project. It's an advent calendar for your dog. <laughs> So we've got our pre-orders like going on right I now. I like it's, it. It's really fun. We'll try to get this out in a timely manner <laughs> so you can get those orders right. in on time. I'm not sure we'll live up to that. but That's okay. Yeah. They can. We'll do it again next year. An so. advent calendar uh, not used properly can also be turned into perhaps an Easter or a Valentine's yeah, absolutely. calendar. Absolutely. Christmas in July. Do your backwards math yeah. and just figure it out. Yeah. The dog won't know the difference. No, the dog's no. just happy to get a biscuit. And it's like, ah. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. So with all of this, do you have competition? Is there anybody that makes the same stuff? For sure. Yeah. So I was definitely not the first one to start making a liquid dog, quote unquote, dog beer. Yeah. I'm, I've seen those. Yeah. Um, so there's a handful of those and more coming up for sure. It's like turning into little, like, I don't know. I always picture going to the liquor store. And when I first started this, I was like, man, it would be really cool to have, like, a, a mix pack for your dog. And now I'm actually seeing, like, pet boutiques starting to do that. And I think that's really cool. Hmm. Um, so there is I'm competition. I'm picturing a dog, like, standing outside of a liquor store, like, with a paper bag <laughs> around the dog beer, just, you know, just turning it, mm-hmm. getting turned up, just totally. tearing it up. But, you know, maybe I have the wrong wrong vision here. All right, so they're like making variety packs for the dog? Um, so Yeah, there's there's a different a different uh, competitor, a different maker who does different several different styles of beer. I just do the one right now. It's a beefy flavored thing, and it's got glucosamine in it for their joints, so it's, I like to say, potent in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there are other competitors. There's other folks, you know, making a spent grain dog treat. As long as you have those spent grains, you're either a home brewer or have some source from a brewery. It's not necessarily a complex treat to make other than it takes a really long time to bake it long yeah, enough I to, would be, never to dry wanna, enough. I would never want to make my own. Oh, I'd just yeah. go to beerpaws.com and I buy know. some. But there, so there are, there are competitors. There's, you, from what I can tell, um, we have worked with, Beer Paws has worked with more breweries than anyone else. I mean, 70 sounds like a lot. Yeah. So a lot of, there are, you know, sometimes we'll approach a brewery and they're like, oh man, our like assistant brewer's wife or so-and-so's mom bakes our dog treats for us. And I'm like, that's cool, man. If you want to, if you want to do something else or they realize that's too annoying, just hit us up and we're happy to help you out down the road. I think that the return on your time will far outweigh the nine ninety nine. Isn't that about <laughs> the sweet spot? That I think everything yeah, was nine ninety nine. Pretty wasn't much, it? yeah. 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 Uh, and how many biscuits is that? So roughly, it's, yeah, it's six ounces, and depending on the weight of the, because the the grains can make it vary a little bit depending on what we were baking with, but usually that's going to be somewhere in the like twenty one to twenty five biscuits. Okay. Mm-hmm. You can also go to some breweries that work with us. And put 50 cents into an old school, like, dog treat machine. Like, one of those vending machines that would spit out, like, a bouncy ball or something. Nice. Yeah. So we've got beer paws machines, too. I like that. I like that <laughs> a lot. I mean, I think that as far as dogs go, the lack of thumbs would be really frustrating when it came to right? using that in a self-dispensing kind of way. <laughs> but, all right. So, and I can buy, I, I mean, it, it appears as if all the stuff was for sale mm-hmm. at your site. So... Have you had to learn some stuff about e-commerce and order fulfillment? And, oh, my gosh, and, yeah. And by the way, like, you can go to U- our, the Startup Hustle YouTube channel and see the look on Crystal's face because mm-hmm. that's the look yeah. that everyone has on their face when they realize, oh, shit, we've got to ship these things. Uh-huh, yeah, it's it's the funnest part of the day. 
No, the, said no one. <laughs> right. The 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 <laughs> e-commerce side of things honestly has always been the weakest link for me. Um, Why? Meaning like the management or the marketing part? Um, a little bit of both. I feel like I was a little better at the marketing for a while. You know, it's it's still it's a, it's a little bitty operation, so I still wear most of the hats all the time. And, and that's why you can roll your eyes at the order fulfillment because, uh -huh. like, I'll give you an example. I've written three books, and you know, it's easy to say like, "Oh, well, I'll just ship these." Right? Hell no, uh -huh. man, because you don't sell a ton of them. Like, yeah. I mean, and I hopefully you you do, but unless you're selling like enough orders to keep someone busy full time, yeah. You have to stop what you're doing. Now, uh -huh. now, look, the purpose of your business is to sell stuff, so do stop what you're doing and get the orders out the door. But it's, it's the day when you sell one, mm -hmm. and you're like, God, and you're not anywhere near, and something else is gone. you got to like stop what you're doing. you got to go open up a program. you got to do something. you got to print a label. you got to get all the stuff. And the next thing you know, you've like spent an hour shipping one $10 oh, yeah. item or something. Uh -huh. yeah. Or driving. I've got my favorite days, too, are when I have several orders, but it's not necessarily cheapest to ship them all through UPS or yeah. FedEx or the post office. And, so and, I and get they to won't go come pick it up when there's one. No, yeah. no. And so I get to go to all three. Those are fun. Well, and then I struggled because I was at my, uh, at my house for the longest time. I couldn't really get pickups to happen anyway. So I was just like, well, build that into every day. Got to yeah. have the old UPS FedEx post office run. I mean, that's maybe part of the process. I mean, we did some stuff. I used to own a ticket business, and we sold – um, a lot of stuff. So sometimes we'd have 200 packages mm -hmm. and FedEx and, and UPS fought over who would get our That's account because nice. that was like great, you know, yeah. but they were really nice about it. But yeah, then there was other times too, like with other things we've done, just like, oh man, <laughs> there's no way I'm making any money right. doing this. So. Well, and even for me, honestly, like here's another scrappy little like bootstrapping tip. So sometimes I don't want to invest in the shipping boxes. So we were talking earlier about reusing things. Yep. So we reuse a whole lot of Amazon boxes that my friends and family still still save. Like it just depends. If I can if I can use it, I will. And so especially if in you the holiday season. If you follow Amazon standards, that means something the size of a of a refrigerator box. You would put one right, thing yeah. of dog biscuits uh -huh. and then like eight hundred pounds of foam. Uh-huh. Sounds Every about, time. Sounds about yeah. right. right. <laughs> Have you explored alternate sales channels like Amazon? Yeah, we're on I've got uh, my core products, and then some are uh, on, on Amazon. Amazon? Mm -hmm. And we and doing the FBA, huge hassle. And luckily, I had some consultants help me get that rolling. Um, but did you talk to our friends at Marknology by chance? I sure did. You did. Yeah. All right, there you go. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> I talked to Andrew right before the podcast. Oh. He comes in. He's been a regular guest on this. But yeah, and and by the way, and you know, we'll give him a shout out over there. You talk about that stuff's a lot. It's like, here you go. You're like, I'm just trying to sell some dog biscuits. Right. And they're like, but you got to do this and got to do this. and You got to know this. And if it sits there too long, we're going to charge you a zillion dollars. Oh, yeah. And like, you can get yourself upside down in a oh, hurry. Real quick, real quick. So, yeah. but I love the FBA, you know, then I can just see like, oh, something sold. But that's another thing I do like about. And that's what you're paying for with Amazon. Some people yep. are like, I don't want to pay that big percent. Yeah. Guess what? They're doing the work for you. Mm -hmm. They're pushing it out the door. And so the, the and they're selling it. The There's flip, that part. The flip side on that on those wholesale platforms, that's nice, um, is that I you know I still have to pack things up and ship them out the door, but I don't have to go spend the time trying to find these buyers or worry about if my inventory is sitting in some distributor's warehouse just right. getting old. Yeah. And I'm so I'm happy to give up a percent to places like Fair for that. Yeah, and that's, and I mean, and, yeah, and don't be cheap, people. Like, your time has value. So with that, you spend a lot of time doing event-based marketing. I do, yeah. Did you like that transition? That was pretty strong, was really wasn't smooth, it? Yeah. Sorry, I usually don't stop to, like, point that out, but, yeah. And then I ruined it. Um, <laughs> but, no, event-based, uh, you you are an expert at event marketing. I, you, I, well, I feel I am too, but for different reasons. I um, I do what I call experience-based marketing, mm -hmm. and that's how we promote full scale. And we do things that are different. We take people to concerts and sports and just different stuff like that, and we give them an experience that is our whole marketing approach. Right. And it's highly effective because if I take you to see new kids on the block, you will not forget me, <laughs> <laughs> even if you're not a fan. You're like, hey, this is fun, but we – 
you know, use that approach to put people that uh, have like, you know, entrepreneurs, influencers, and investors, mm -hmm. and we take the work out of networking. So I've learned to really appreciate event marketing. Now with that, it takes a lot of effort. It does. I mean, it's not like you just show up at the event. Well, you can, but it's probably going to suck. You got to put a little planning into it. So let's talk about your approach to event marketing, how you how you have used that successfully, or perhaps not. Mm -hmm. So, for me, a big part of it was from from the beginning, rolling out with a fairly cohesive brand, and that meant having having a cool a cool logo with you know, more than just the logo, also with our brand colors and the brand pattern, which I've ex extended into a fully wrapped vehicle and spent a lot of money on the fully branded tents and tablecloths, mm -hmm. all of it. So, so you actually look like you're in the business of doing what you do? Yeah. 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 That matters, people. It really... It, it, no, it does. It does. It does. It's key. I, I, I literally wrote a whole section in, a, in one of my books about that. I'm like, right. it's like people that don't want to have a website. They're like, I don't need a website. I'm like, cool. It's like, you know, almost 2020. I mean, you kind of, it's like the modern day business card. You're like, <laughs> if you don't have a website, then I mean, you're not really serious. Or but, if you're yeah. at an event and you yeah. only, you only accept cash. Yeah, true. Yeah. Oh. I don't want to pay the fees. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, so with that, did you have to kind of feel around to get the right branding? approach or did you feel like you knew what you were doing and got it right? Um, I think I was lucky. I worked really closely with a, um, one of my best friends who's a badass artist. That's not lucky. That's actually yeah. just being prepared and right. being thoughtful. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, felt, I felt lucky that I got to brainstorm with him and he, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have to pay really anything. We just had some beers and came up with a pretty beautiful brand that has has lasted <laughs> and continues to get really great comments. Do you have tips for branding a product that people may find useful? I've got a couple after you do. Um, I don't know how I would answer that one. I guess my brain, my uh, brain I'll is go, going I'll go, I'll go, I'll go first you go and first, maybe you'll follow. My, yeah, because my brain was going Make it clear different. what it is that you do. Yeah. Like, meaning like beer paws, like... You know, it can't, it, don't choose some font that no one can read oh, or make it worst. too small or just don't try to get mm -hmm. overly clever. Like, look at Facebook's logo, which they launched a new logo yesterday, which is just a capital letters version of Facebook. But the point is, it's like one of the biggest companies in the world. And it, because it's clear and to the point, right. like, this is, this is our name. This is what we do. Right. And, you know, so many times, and especially when you're selling something, you look at, at shrinking down your logo or stuff like that. Like how 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 clear is this when it's the size of a thumbnail? Because mm -hmm. if you can't clearly read it and tell what it is, go back to the drawing board. And that's something I learned from from being an author. Because the first the first before my first book came out, I thought I had I hired a cover artist and I showed it to my editor and he's like, this sucks. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean it looks great? He's like, shrink it down to a thumbnail and call me back. And right. I and I, he like hung up on me. He was like not having it. <laughs> And uh, I did that, and I called him back, and I was like, dude, okay, I get it. And that was, like, my first lesson. But that, I mean, but your brand, it needs to be specific. And yep. the thumbnail thing's important, too, because you're, it, when you're for sale, when it's for sale in anywhere, it's going to mm -hmm. be shrunk. It's going to be little. So, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, I think that's one of the, the things, too. And then um, also, like, if you're packaging something, like, don't make it annoying. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to wrestle your product to get into it. <laughs> and I don't like it to be overly wasteful. Something like a dog biscuit doesn't have to, like, have a metal cage around it, right? Right, yeah. That that, that can be frustrating. We And I've had some ups and downs with, with the packaging and stuff like that, too. We have fully branded six-pack carriers, and our first run of them are really cool looking, but they, like, the cardboard isn't really strong enough to reliably mm -hmm. hold six bottles of beer, and so... People might pick it up by the handle that's like you good, would a yeah. six pack, and then yeah, that's good, good thing the bottles are made of plastic and not glass. So I I'd like <laughs> to tell you something because I at one point uh, attempted to launch a pet related product. Mm -hmm. So my cousin owns a bunch of ranches in Texas, and there are deer and elk everywhere, and dogs love to chew they do. those antlers. So. At one point, I was like, and my cousin's name is Tommy, I was like, you know what, we could make a brand. And mm -hmm. this is where I learned some of these things, but <laughs> uh, I was like, these deer and elk are, are, you know, and by the way, they're ex kind of expensive. 
They're real expensive, yeah. Yeah, and dogs and dogs love them. I mean, they're good. They're good, but and it lasts for a really long time. That's one of the selling points. Yeah, well, that's another thing too. Yeah, if, as long as it's not out in the elements, it really doesn't have mm -hmm. a shelf life. Right. Um, but yeah, so he was like, "Yeah, I got like a hundred pounds of antlers in the barn." I was like, "Cool, let's cut them up," and we put them in a couple different places, and they sold out like fast. Mm -hmm. And then we realized, or I, at least I realized, that you have to sell a lot of six and ten dollar items. Mm -hmm. That was my reminder with that, and I kind of saw shiny things and chased it other places. But sure, yeah, yes, that is very true. And kind of bringing that back to that's kind of like the cost of goods, though. Like we Absolutely. didn't have any. I mean, right. on some level, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But no, bringing it back to kind of that event marketing side of things, that was one lesson that I figured out pretty early, and still continue to try to get better at it. But when I'm setting up at a at a, be at a beer festival or some sort of pet related event if I just have that one product if I just have dog beer and dog biscuits if someone comes up to my table and they're not interested in either of those two things then I've lost an opportunity to sell to that person at all and so in those particularly in those settings then we'll bring out other other beer paws branded products but also <coughs> other things that can catch their eye and bring them in it's you know this season it's doggy pajamas or whatnot and i see i run into other vendors at these events all the time that you know maybe just have dog bandanas or something and mm -hmm. i'm like you have to bring something else for these events or you're going to be upside down every single time so and event, get their uh, emails events, i didn't do that, that from the beginning. that's hard to do sometimes but uh, you know another thing too is you can do some clever things like just, you got to remove obstacles like Put a QR code or in the back of your car or just something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. Be shocked at how lazy people are when it comes to like entering a URL or yeah. just doing oh, something. Yeah. But um, so when you look at an event, there's events everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. No matter what you're doing, there's too many events. That means some of them are better than others. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you look for when you choose a good event? Because you can only go to one. Mm -hmm. What well, you can personally. Yeah. Exactly. So I pay attention to a lot of a lot of different things. You know, first and foremost, is this an event where I think my target customer is going to be? If it's at a brewery, even if it's a little tiny little <coughs> pop up Halloween dress up with your dogs at a brewery, I really want to be there. Even if I don't sell a lot, it's still a great opportunity to reinforce a relationship with a with a brewery that I may already be working with or want to work with more and an opportunity to work, um, to come face to face and interact with that brewery's customers who would also be my target audience. Um, there's also, I also take into consideration how much it costs to be part of the event. And I'll look at that both ways. If there's no cost to be part of an event and they're having a whole lot of vendors or something, that may actually may be, I may not be interested in it. I do a variety of events and some of them we pay thousands of dollars to be there because <coughs> I know that the people coming through the doors there are serious and they're there and they're ready to shop. Yeah, and that's a note that I put down is what are people there to do? Yeah. That's a big yep. thing for me. Like mm -hmm. and then also like in 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 this in your case, perhaps what time of day is it? Yep. Because if it's a beer fest and like I don't know, like I mean you could tell me maybe drunk mm -hmm. people buy more dog biscuits, but you know, the thing is, is if it's at like 11 at night, people might not want to, if you're selling products, people have to carry them around. Right. And like, it's different if it's small, like women to have purses and sometimes they don't. But right. I mean, sometimes people just don't want to lie. I, I'm like that. I, I won't buy stuff because I yep. just don't want to carry it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I didn't have bags for the longest time. Cause I, I don't even want to carry it. I didn't want to create, yeah. I didn't really want to add more plastic bags just for someone to walk away with it. And that was annoying. And, and thank you for that. To, by the way. to have to deal with that. So when I do have bags, I have some kind of tote bag and I generally make the person, unless they spend a whole bunch and I'm like, and you get a free tote bag. Mm -hmm. I work that in to be a product that they want or work it into a bundle so that it comes with it. And so that's been helpful, but you make a great point that it does, the, the time of day does matter. You know, yeah, because I'm thinking like a beer festival and it's something that's in the evening. I mean, like, I don't know. It, it depends, but middle of the day beer festivals are oftentimes a little bit better. They get, uh, people get drunk a lot faster at wine festivals. Mm. So I feel like beer festivals are better for me. 
<laughs> Does a drunker customer buy more stuff, or are they just there's more a, annoying? There's the tipping point, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I bet. Okay, well, um, first off, thanks for coming by. This has been interesting. Oh, for sure. Um, we, you are part of our larger effort to reach out to a the widest variety of, and I'm not kidding, the widest variety of entrepreneurs that we can find. You know, really, in the end. I think entrepreneurs and founders and people that have a hustle, like we're all kind of doing the same thing. We just kind of doing it with different stuff. Uh I mean, it's really like the same rules. You kind of get down into these like X's and O's of business and marketing and just stuff like that. I mean, it's the same stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's funny in business school, they often refer to widgets. Uh They they don't tell you something like company, Acme Co. makes (laughs) widgets. And you're like, Fuck you, widgets. If I hear about widgets again, <laughs> this is why I've dropped out of five schools because I just can't handle widgets. I have no tolerance for it. I want to sell real stuff. But anyway, so <laughs> as, as we uh, head towards our, our closing moments with the Founders Freestyle, once again, go to beerpaws.com on Instagram. Go to at beerpaws. I was just there. I am your newest follower. Excellent. There's, you have a lot of people following you. There's quite a few in there. So. Um, it's definitely easier to get people to interact with things that involve pets or babies. Isn't it though? Yeah. 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 So congrats on that. It's sometimes Thank harder you. with, I, I've noticed that like I can post a picture of my daughter and I'll get like this remarkably high social engagement and then I'll like announce like a major like life event and like five people will Crickets. like it. And I'm like, what's wrong with you people? They're like, we don't really care. Yeah. No. Show us another picture of your kid. Yeah, no doubt. If I'm going to get my kid to start announcing important stuff and then I'll win. There you go. Yeah, I'm positive about that. But, you know, while you're, while you're out there, go to fullscale.io and check out what we do to help businesses grow their software development teams. Remember, this episode's also on YouTube, so you can see our talking heads. And while you're out there, Racing through the internet, buying dog biscuits at beerpaws.com. Stop by our Instagram page. Well, Breland came in and took some pictures of us, and I feel like we're looking good. We're looking good today, we right? Are. Definitely worth going oh, and checking yeah. out. So um, we end our episodes of Startup Hustle now with what we call the Founders Freestyle, which means you get the mic, and you can say whatever you want. It can be advice. It can be a pitch. You really get to do whatever you want. It's freestyle. So there you go. Oh, no warning at all there. Yeah, that's the best way to have it. It's got to be like an improv. It's a freestyle. What? You're not supposed to think about it. You're not supposed to like plan it. Say whatever you want. Get, I'll, I can guide you if you want. Yeah. What would someone that wanted to follow in your footsteps do? What's some of the best advice that you could give even a female entrepreneur or mm-hmm. someone that wanted to launch a product or anything like that? Inspire us, Crystal. Right, right. That's, that, that's pressure. All right. Yeah, that, that is pressure. But so one thing that I would say has been really great for me more, more recently that I think, I think people don't always think about is you go down the path, this entrepreneurial path, and man, it's like the thing that obsesses you and it's the only thing you want to talk about. And it's awesome and terrifying. And maybe you like dump because it's the only thing that obsesses your brain, you dump all of that, the good and the bad and the ugly and all of it on the people closest to you, your partner or your parents or your best friend, whatever, whoever fills that role in your life. And what's been really great for me lately, and I would, I would challenge others to find, to kind of find their, their partner, their, their like kind of, doesn't have to be a partner in business, but like, your business buddy. And so since I started working with that other company, Barksville Bakery, it's been really great for both of us in, I think, our personal lives as well because we can, like, dump all of this stuff on each other and sort it out together and not inadvertently burden the people around us so much. And that has resulted in I, I feel like I'm having better relationships outside of my business because I have another – another channel for this that makes sense so i hope i hope that made sense yeah sure um i mean you i mean that's i think that's pretty common and in some regards that's why like our event-based marketing has gone well because um you get to actually like bring like my wife as a saint is the most patient person (laughs) i've ever known but at the on the flip side i warned her coming in i'm like hey you know i was married once before and i you know i was kind of maybe opposed to it on the i was like <laughs> but I'm like I, it, like i'll try this again but you gotta know like i'm it's kind of burnt in at this point i'm i'm who i am now yeah i made a couple notes while you were talking and you mentioned the the term obsession and um there's there are 
these things, like the term obsession is an external point of view. Someone is saying that you're obsessed. There's a very fine line between things like, are you obsessed or are you driven? Right. It depends who you ask. It totally if does. If you ask someone looking at me, they might like, he's obsessed with I, I'm highly driven. I would like to be successful. The same thing goes with stuff like genius or crazy. Because, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, and, and the thing is, is people put, the, it's someone else's label. And, the, and I have, for the last couple years, I have been fascinated with the genius and crazy debate. And I literally have learned to leverage my, well, I find that if people find you interesting or credible, Mm -hmm. then they're willing to sit down and talk to you about what they do well. So I have been able to, over the last couple of years, I've sat down with rock stars and artists and like all kinds of cool people and had the debate or the discussion of of like, am I a genius or am I crazy? Like, what's the (laughs) difference? And the best answer I have gotten is, who gives a shit? Exactly. And I was like, whoa, that's the answer. But <laughs> like really, it. in the end, there's no way to define it because, it, it, like with genius or crazy, you look at, okay, look at Elon Musk. Some people say he's a genius. Some people say he's crazy because he talks about, oh, we live in a computer generated reality, but he's Elon Musk. Right. So he's a genius. But if he wasn't like doing all this crazy stuff, you'd be like, dude, put your tinfoil hat back on. <laughs> Get back out there with the dog that's drinking beer paws in the paper bag, and you guys talk all about it. That's but, fun. But Don't the, tell us but about it. But the point is, is unless it, that's all someone else's external point of view. So in the end, who cares? you got to do what makes you happy. Now, um, what you also mentioned was just kind of related to a general sense of balance. And um, in my book, Balance Me, I talk all about personal, professional, and physical. And you got to find a balance that works for you. Yep. And if you don't find the balance that works for you, you will not be able to help anyone else be happy because you will be fucking miserable. Yep. And if you're obsessed or you're driven, that's me. That's just part of what comes with it. So you got to look for people to be in and around your life that are going to tolerate you for what makes you happy as well. I mentioned my wife is a saint, Jill. You really are. Like you have put, oh my God. And maybe she's just really <laughs> good at not listening to me. But also it's patience though because, you know, like... I mean, it is what it is. Like, I would have a very difficult time changing, you know, where I'm at. And there's certain things that I want to get to. But I want, but when I get there, I want to make sure that those that help me get there get to enjoy all of it, too. Exactly. And I think, yeah, yeah, that's the the other thing that has helped me. Like, I feel like I'm in a much clearer headspace over in the past couple of months than I was. And it was, it was getting, getting my house back and having some different kinds of boundaries. And that, that allows me to have different types of conversations with my grandma or with well, that's my how partner. Well, that's how I know, you know Andrew, Andrew Morgan. So I've acted as a pseudo mentor to him for almost two years now. But I like to do that because a lot of people have done that for me. Yeah. And it's sometimes you just want to ask someone that won't be like, man, you're fucking stupid. Why are you asking that? Right, yeah. Like that, as, it, when you have that, and I define these relationships with people. Like Andrew will mention that I have, acted as a mentor for him and so what does that mean it means you can call me i will take your call and you can ask me whatever you want i have two rules one don't waste my time two (laughs) don't get mad when i don't tell you what you want when i tell you something you don't want to hear i don't want to debate whether you ask me i'm going to give you my opinion it is what it is you don't have to accept it but the advice was free if you don't like it here's (laughs) your money back so well anyway based on that i'm going to go check out now i don't have a dog but i'm going to go buy something at beer pause (laughs) So, because I think I can find a dog somewhere. Anyway, (laughs) see you next time. Thank you.